Hi, welcome to the sixth installment of Hunters Living with Art. Uh, normally you see us filming at the Nancy Thomas Gallery Warehouse, or the Avocado as we call it, but today I am so thrilled because we are filming at the Chrysler Museum of Art in Norfolk, Virginia. And I have two guests, Michael Berlucci and Seth Feeman. So here we go. So I am sitting here with my two guests, as I said, Seth Feeman and Michael Berlucci, and I want to give them their proper intros because they have some outstanding credits behind them. Michael Berlucci is the Community Engagement Manager for the Chrysler Museum of Art. He um, is very active in volunteering for many, many organizations. There's um, Teens with Purpose, the United Negro College Fund, Hope House Foundation, uh, Virginia Beach for Fairness, and the list actually goes on. The newest thing that's happened in his life, he was appointed Virginia Beach City Council. He was chosen to fill a position in the Rose Hall District, and when November elections come along, he'll be running for that. And our second guest is Seth Feeman. He is the Deputy Director for Art and Interpretation and the Curator of Photography for the Chrysler Museum of Art. He has his BA in Art History from Vassar and an MA and a PhD in American Studies from William & Mary College. Welcome to you both. Thank you, thanks for really having happy. us. Yeah, thanks for being here. Um, I have a million questions. I have to start off. <laughs> I do want to start with you, Michael. So, um, being the Community Engagement Manager, um, this sounds sort of like a generic question, but I would like your impressions on how you feel art impacts the community. Well, for me, I always loved coming to museums for a variety of reasons, growing up all throughout my life. And I think that for um, any community, it's important to have cultural institutions because they are keepers of our history, because they inspire us, because it's nice to have some place to look at things that are beautiful or even more than that thing objects that make us think and consider how we relate to each other and an art museum does all of those things and um, that's why they've always been places that are really important to me personally and I think that they're important to any community they enrich our quality of life. Very nice. Um, another thing I'm thinking about community engagement is how do you handle engaging a diverse community? I mean, there's lots of different people to please, and you know, some people could get disinterested if, if they only see one type of art. What, how do you deal with that? Well, I think it's important to always remember that you can't be all things to all people, and we don't try to do that here. But what we do try to do is create a culture of hospitality. Everyone should be welcome here. That's first and foremost. And we start that by literally opening the door for every guest. And then we've removed the barrier of admission. And we, um, and Seth will tell you more about this as it relates to the collecting side and to the curating works of art. But we try to create programming and partnership that is relevant to people who live in our community. Because ultimately, we want to make sure that this incredible institution is accessible to more people. and that our visitors more fully reflect the community we serve in Hampton Roads. Speaking of that though, how do you acquire pieces here, Seth? I mean, how, how yeah, does this happen? That's a good happen? question. Uh, there's a lot of ways that works come into the collection. Uh, the way the Chrysler Museum began was when Walter Chrysler uh, Jr. gave his collection to established the Chrysler Museum it's in like 10,000 pieces or something. That's right, it's about, it's about that many and um, he had been working on developing this collection for decades before he came to Norfolk. Um, and since then, uh, a gift like that inspires other people to give as well and we have been very, um, we have benefited greatly from generosity. Um, so there are many collectors in our community, there are even many collectors that are far beyond our community but they hear about what we're doing and they're excited about what we're accomplishing down here and so we, we oftentimes acquire things that way. We also have uh, some modest funds to purchase work from time to time and there's an elaborate process that that goes through because when we make a commitment to a work of art, we're effectively committing to it for forever and the care of a work of art is um, oftentimes an expensive and committed process. So uh, usually it means making sure that we've got the resources to give it the right environmental conditions that it needs, that we're going to show it, 
uh, that we think, and this gets to really what Michael does, is that it's going to engage our community in some way or add something to the conversation or the experience that they might have here. Um, so there's a lot of considerations in the process. Yeah, so I imagine. Yeah. Um, speaking of the exhibitions, how do you, oh, my gosh, you guys do so much here. I mean, there's always something going on, always. Um, how do you look at a year and then go, well, this quarter we're going to feature, you know, um, who we feature, Eric Carl, you know, or yeah. how do you even approach it, it's a great question and it's something actually that um, is a little bit unique to our institution. Um, oftentimes the development of an exhibition is something that happens uh, among uh, curatorial staff exclusively or even a director level, executive level will make decisions about the full year. We have a much more iterative process here. So um, curators might propose a show but sometimes educators will think of an exhibition idea and they'll share that with the staff and we'll develop it with these large in-house teams that we have. It's a pretty exciting process because you get you think about the works in a way that you might not from your own position. So I might be thinking about, well, how does this photography exhibition relate to the history of the medium? What's the story that I want to tell? What's the scholarly insight? But I might not be thinking about how a community member might react to the work or what their response might be. But having Michael in the room at the same time brings that perspective to bear. And we've got people from visitor services, we have uh, people from education, and they all sit on this team. And it really helps us develop the ideas uh, for the shows. And then we try to do very basic things, like make sure that we're offering a variety of things, that it's not the same every time. So anytime somebody comes here, they'll find something different. Uh, we want to reach that's out. That's what I've found. Sorry to cut you off, no, but that's, that's exactly what I have found. You know, yeah. when every time I come, I'm like, I can't believe I didn't, I haven't seen that before. I mean, I feel like I've been here a lot, yeah. <laughs> but I keep discovering new things. Yeah, well it's one way that we reach new audiences. So for example, we've got this Eric Carl exhibition on now and th through September and we have reached an audience of families with young kids that oftentimes they'd be coming to the museum anyways, but in the numbers now it's been pretty incredible. People really respond to this material um, and people who are nostalgic for the material come see the show and the hope is that they come for our special exhibition and then they'll walk around the galleries and see the other things that they didn't know about. This is a question for both of you. So. Everyone that knows the Chrysler knows that it's world renowned for its glass collection. I mean, it's just stunning. And I think, isn't there, it's like the biggest collection in the world or there's some sort of, tell me about that it's, first. It's high in numbers, yeah. We've got, we've got about 10,000 works in glass here as well. Uh, and it is, I'd say one of the top three or four uh, largest and most significant collections of glass in the United States. And then you started Glass Studios. That's right, there's a studio across the street which is part of our campus and we have classes there, workshops and a performance program. It's, it's an exciting place. What is something lesser known? Tell me something that, you, that I wouldn't know about the Chrysler and maybe not on the website and it's just something, a nice little Easter egg or surprise. Every museum has a, a specialty and I think that um, Seth would probably tell you about, better than I could, about some of the um, highlights of our photography collection, but there's quite a bit of really interesting, I think, treasures within the collection. For example, the Chrysler Museum is, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but the foremost repository of work from Susan Watkins, mm -hmm. um, one of the most under-recognized female painters in American history. Um, Tell us who she is. Well, the... I'm going to let Seth, I'll get something wrong if I, if I go too far down that road, but um, but I will tell you that she um, was married to the American painter William Merritt Chase and um, he of course his work is very famous and well known and I think her work is lesser known certainly and we're very lucky to have this um, kind of record of her work at the museum and here in Norfolk and it's, it's on display and I, and I think that um, many people who visit aren't familiar with that and I'll let, Eric, um, I'll let Seth tell you more about um, her sort of context as an American artist, but that's, that's something that's very special and unique about the Chrysler. It's actually something that's happened a few times, and it, it's happened again recently, where artists will give an entire estate of work, and it really allows us to show a different, a different uh, side or a different dimension to the artist. So uh, we have William Trost Richards estate, uh, that's maybe too, too broad to say, but we have a significant holding of work. And those are both, they're both American artists um, who are working the late 19th and early 20th century. And it just gives you a different perspective because a lot of museums, ours included, oftentimes will collect one work by one artist because that's what you can get. Um, and it gives you a great example of that work. But 
Uh, having multiple works allows you to make comparisons yes. uh, and uh, allows you to see development over time. Uh, and that's something that we can really share with our visitors in a different way. Um, and sometimes it shows you how they have maybe humble beginnings and how they're figuring things out. I find it kind of inspiring to see even these great artists have bad days and, uh, and then they figure out a way to work around it or what the next step is going to be. So. What is your first memory of art? Like, does, was your house full of art growing up or was your bedroom decorated with art? Mm, that's or? a good question. I didn't, we didn't have a lot growing up. I grew up in Nashville, Tennessee, and um, uh, we lived uh, not terribly far away from an estate, uh, a sort of house museum called Cheekwood, which was um, a 19th century, early 20th century home and um, sort of museum associated with it. Uh, it was mostly a garden, so my mom would take me there so I would like run wild. But it started me getting interested because I could kind of run out in the lawns and it would be fine. But then I'd go inside to cool off and there's these incredible works of art. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember a couple of the pieces when I was there and it was really exciting because you're in this historic home and you're kind of going around these stairs and you're going into these rooms and then there's a work of art there and it reminded you that people live with these things. Um, it's something that's oftentimes hard for a museum to convey, but a work of art has its own history and its own context. Um, and so we put a lot of works together in a room to create a dialogue among those works. But when you are in someone's home, you realize that people live with these things every day. And you get that sense that like you too can live with these things, that you've got this personal connection with them. So we would go often enough that I would start to feel like they're kind of mine, you know? Like they're my, it's my collection. Yeah, that's right, that's right. <laughs> Um, so it, we didn't have it in our own home though, but it's some, like it was this other home that I could go to and feel like you get your own attachment, your own connection to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What was the first piece of art that you ever bought? Like that you felt like, I buying art? Uh, that's a good question. So I, I, I've been buying pieces sort of off and on for a long time, but usually because uh, you get connected to artists along the way, and so um, I, I've, whenever I've bought art, which is very infrequently, uh, but when I do have enough to get a piece, it's always something that I have that personal connection with. So it's either through a friend um, or through someone whose work I've been following for a long time. Um, it's nice to have that personal connection. It's not about telling some great history of art story. It's about things that I want to live with. with and that I connect with. Yeah, absolutely. You have to look at it every day, so you don't want to go. Like, oh. I mean, I've moved art out, like. I've outgrown art. Yeah. Not much, but I have moved on from yeah. some pieces. Yeah. What about you, Michael? My first memory of art. First piece that first you ever piece. bought. I that bought made a, you feel like a grown up. Uh, well, I bought a painting with my aunt at the Boardwalk Art Show mm -hmm. in Virginia Beach, which is um, it was a tradition of ours to go together every year after when she would pick me up early from school. And one year I had enough money to buy like a small painting of something. And um, I feel like maybe I've outgrown that work too. It felt like a big deal to me at the time. Yeah. But, um, but that was the first piece of original artwork that I purchased, yeah. And I think I was in high school. All right, this is for both of you. Um, do you have a favorite artist? I'll just start with you, Seth. Oh, that's that's like a totally impossible question. Really? Yeah, no, it's, it, it, it really changes a lot. I mean, um, I get pretty obsessed with the artists who I'm going to put on view, So because you spend a lot of time studying the work. Um, and I'm working on a photo show right now, which um, uh, is a rotation of things that we've collected recently. Uh, and so I'm, uh, you know, things that I, I uh, petitioned for us to purchase in the last five years, and then some of them didn't go out on view immediately. So now's the first time and I'm sort of thinking about them in a new way. So one of them is this photograph by a photographer named Chris McCall. And he, uh, he's a West Coast based photographer. And he's developed this camera that tracks the sun. So it's on a pivot and it rotates as the sun moves. And it's got a really highly powered lens inside. So as it moves, it's actually condensing the sun's rays in and the sun burns a hole in the back of the negative. So what, when you look at the work itself, uh, you look at the negative and you see this cut hole into oh, the background, wow. which is made by the sun moving. So you think of a, a photograph as, a, as an instant. Mm -hmm. Photographs are quick. But this is a 31 hour long photograph. And so the sun makes this arc along the horizon over the course of a day. It's pretty incredible to see. Well, and that it's on film. Yeah. I mean, it's actually yeah. using film and yeah. it's not digital. That's right. That's <laughs> so right. That's, a, that's something I know about, like the new, it's not new, it's, you know, digital stuff. But I started out with film 
and it was more hands-on, like tangible, and so you can't get yeah. stuff like, oh, well, you probably could, maybe, I don't know, but it doesn't seem like you'd get the same thought behind that patience, that yeah. type of patience. Yeah, yeah, it's an interesting process because it involves him being alert and following the camera for the entire time, so it's sort of an endurance project as well, which is exciting to think about. Like to get in some of these people's heads. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Like, or maybe not, <laughs> maybe not. So this is kind of a strange question, and I, I thought of it the other day. I'm reading a book, um, and it's called The Artist Apprentice. I've been waiting eight months for this thing to be available from the library. And um, one of the conversations that was had in there, is, it's, it's during the post-impressionist period, and this one guy said, you know, I don't want to have um, a show where people are, you know, there's a card with the name and the title, you know, I just want to have it up and see what happens, what kind of, emotions come from that. What do you think about that? I mean, you're an academic, you're both academics, and you have a museum that's here to inform and educate. How would you feel about going into a gallery where there's no information? It's just... It's, it's an interesting question. So I, I started here right when we were doing the renovation and reinstallation uh, in 2013-14. Uh, and it's something that we talked a lot about as an institution, about what kind of environment do we want to create. And as Michael said, I think quite right, is that you kind of can't do everything at once. You can't be everything to everyone. You have to make choices. And here we really made the conscious decision, we want this place to be welcoming and inviting, especially for people who maybe don't have that much experience. So we listened to our visitors and they didn't want to come to a place where they're not going to get any information. They wanted to have that kind of uh, they wanted to have some direction because a lot of them felt like they might not know about the work or not, not, not know what to think. And those of us who maybe have more exposure to art, it's easy for us to ignore what the curators are trying to tell us anyways. We just sort of do our own thing. Um, it's easier to sort of pull away from that material than it is to go the other direction. Um, on the other hand, I really like going to a gallery where there's nothing and no one's trying to inform me. I'm trying to have my own experience. But, um, I don't know that that would be ideal here at this institution. I think our visitors really get something out of the kind of information that we provide. And Seth summarized the museum's position very well, but I think it's worth noting one of my favorite artists is, Mark, is the artist Mark Rothko. And Rothko intended his work um, to be seen without those labels, just as you described. And the reason that he did is because he viewed his work um, to, to elicit emotion from the viewer. And um, I find that very exciting. Personally, I enjoy that experience. And I uh, oftentimes am not personally interested in what the curator is offering. And I, and I really, and I really um, find that exciting. But we also do want to provide information so that people can learn. After all, museums are educational institutions. I think this is a great time for a moment of refreshment <laughs> with our Kimberly McInnes glasses. And um, I'm going to enjoy it. Mm. It was really good. It is good. <laughs> it is good. I've had a couple of, uh, maybe one or two misses on the drinks because uh -huh. I just randomly pick them. You know, yeah, I think this one's one. great. No, yeah. It's that one's sweet a good one. and a little bit tart. It's great. All right. This is a question. I am struggling with all the social media stuff. I mean, struggling in that. Um, I'm getting better at it. I don't feel like doing it, <laughs> um, but it's w everywhere. It's the way of the world, and I do get it. And um, but my question is: Do you feel like um, social media has changed the way we interpret art, or the way we see art? I mean, how, do you think it's molding it or changing it in any way? Start. I'll start with you. I do. I do because. Um, for what, whatever it is, people are documenting their visits to the museum and their experiences with art. I don't think the artists who created many of the objects that are in our museum today envision that their works would be used as backgrounds for selfies. Um, <laughs> really, that's what they are. They're a background for a selfie. But what's wrong with that? I've done that in here. What's wrong with that? I've used many of them as... so. But um, that's a new way of interacting with objects that um, has developed since the use, the, the you know, implementation of social media. So I think it's interesting. We continue to evolve, and our experiences with the objects around us continue to evolve based on the technology we use. We very much welcome photography in, in the museum, um, but noticing people taking selfies 
changes the way that we are trying to help them in the space because we we don't want them to get hurt and we don't want them to hurt anything either. Um, we have a lot of valuable pieces. So the last thing we want is somebody backing into something because they're trying to get a great selfie. But we want them to get that selfie if that's what they want. So it's, it's a very delicate balance. So you got to think about the minutia of that. Like, I, I'm not thinking, are they going to get hurt or hurt the art? But you have to think of every single level on displaying and presenting art. Yeah, yeah, but it, it does. I mean, Michael's totally right on this. It is a, it is a, a new way in which people are interacting with the work, and uh, it's a very different kind of relationship than we might have had in different times. Um, but it is a, it is certainly a way of engaging with the object, and I, from that perspective, I think there's a great benefit to it. Being the community engagement manager, um, clearly this title says what you do, but have you ever had a situation where you're just talking with someone at a restaurant or, and you maybe overhear someone say, well, I wish that, I don't know, insert X idea here. I mean, have you ever gotten your ideas from the ethos out there and in conversation? Not to oh, go, sure, yeah, to sure. That? Well, a lot of my relationships at work are centered around partnerships with nonprofit organizations, uh, with community leaders, and so most of, I think, the ideas that I have about what we do here, what I do here, are generated outside of the museum itself. For example, I was on a tour of the, of the jail in, in Virginia Beach, and the deputies knew that I worked for the museum and were showing me all these objects that were created by inmates and we worked together after that to create an exhibition with those works. So I think, uh, anyway, I think that my best ideas for the work that I do come from conversations that I have. So the, the show, it was called We're Created? We're Created. No, it was called um, Beyond the Block. Beyond actually. the Block, okay. I'm curious what kind of work they did because they can't, I'm thinking of sculpting, you know, you can't I'm sure they didn't give them knives and stuff. I don't know. No, there were. That, that was the most fascinating part. One of the most fascinating components about that show was that inmates were only allowed access to the objects, to the materials they have in, in jail, which is a high security environment. So, um, it's in, so what you see there is the unbelievable innovation and creativity from people who are incarcerated and humans in general. For example, they did create sculpture, but they used soap to do it or they used toilet paper, or they used um, a variety of other objects. They created um, paintings effectively instead of with pigment from magazines or candy or other food items. Yeah, it was, it was really, it's been a really neat show. And it's been one that I think more, um, that connects us to the community, not only to the people, to the artists who are in, inmates who are incarcerated, but also to the deputies, the sheriff's deputies who are um, really entrusted with their care and to the um, families of people who are incarcerated. You know, we have to remember that many of these people are almost all of them will return to life in our community. So the more that we can understand about their experiences, both with the criminal justice system and, and with life in general that led them to ex their experience with the criminal justice system is good for all of us, in my view. That's so we have unfortunately for me come to the end of our time here at the Chrysler. I want to thank my two guests, Michael Berlucci and Seth Feeman. You guys have been absolutely amazing and informative and thank you very much for your time today. It's fun to be here. Thanks thank for having you us. for being here. All right, well, let's finish off yeah. the evening with our, well, it's afternoon. Cheers. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. Watermelon. It's really good. <laughs> I know. They're really better too when they're right out of the blender. Yeah, yeah. I almost died when I had to bring the blender because I thought Michael's gonna kill me. Because <laughs> I, I was trying to like well. make everything so condensed. Like I want to get in and out. We got to move fast, you know. And then I mixed this. I did a trial of it and I mixed it, and it wouldn't um, um it wouldn't keep like to transport from 12:30 yeah. to 2:30. It would yeah. be kind of mushy. And so I was like, just bring it. And I was like, okay, you guys. So I told Melissa and Kathleen. We gotta time this just right. I want these drinks made the second they walk out here. We're not gonna do any free food. We just gotta be ready. <laughs> and when we clean up, we're out of here.